I am Meng from Lupin Lab, New York University. It's my pleasure to be the host for the first speaker in this seminar, Professor Ben Swartz. Ben is currently associate professor in Central Michigan University, and he grew up in Danville, Ohio. He completed his bachelor's study in chemistry from College of Worcester in 2004, and a PhD in chemistry from Wayne State University in 2020 with Professor Jun Wu Guo studying glycosyl foodstuff initial anchors. After a postdoc with uh, Professor Karin Bertozzi at UC Berkeley, he joined the faculty in Central Michigan University. His research focused on the synthesis of bacteria, carbohydrate, and the development of crops to investigate the microbacterial outer membrane. Among the other recognitions, Ben received many awards, including the Cortell College Science Awards, the Henry Dreyfus Teacher Scholars Awards, and the NSF Career Award. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Meng, for the introduction. I'd also like to thank the ACS CARB Division and Glyconet, as well as the organizers for putting this seminar series together. It's great to have the chance to tell you all about the research that's going on in my lab at CMU, where we're mainly focused on the development of synthetic methods and chemical biology tools to study cell envelope components in mycobacteria. Uh, all bacteria, including uh, gram-positive, and gram-negative bacteria, as well as mycobacteria, which I'll be focusing on today, uh, have cell envelopes that are rich in glycoconjugates and polysaccharides, which have important roles in bacterial physiology and pathogenesis. They're involved in determining cell shape, in providing structural integrity and defense against external stresses, including antibiotic treatment. And because many of these molecules are surface exposed, they may also be involved in host pathogen interactions. Still, uh, many aspects of bacterial carbohydrate structure, biosynthesis, and function are, are poorly characterized. Uh, and this is mainly due to their remarkable structural diversity and complexity, as well as the technical challenges that are associated with synthesizing and investigating them uh, in their native context. Uh, because research progress uh, in these areas is so critical to the development of new antibiotics, uh, diagnostics, and vaccines, uh, new tools are certainly needed to help advance this field of uh, bacterial glycobiology. One of the techniques that's gained a lot of traction in this area over the last 10 years or so is the chemical reporter strategy, which was pioneered by the Bertozzi group. And uh, as many of you know, has been applied quite broadly in glycoscience, including in bacterial systems, as I'll illustrate here. So this is a two-step molecular labeling technique, where first the chemical reporter which contains a bioorthogonal functional group X is fed to the bacterium. That's often an azide uh, that's fed to the bacterium and metabolically incorporated into a glycoconjugate of interest on the cell surface, which can then undergo a highly selective reaction with a complementary functional group Y. This is often an alkyne that is connected to uh, chemical cargo, which will enable some downstream analysis uh, or other application. This entire process is compatible with living systems, and so it can be performed in living bacteria and potentially within uh, host organisms as well. Uh, various applications for these strategies are possible, including imaging and profiling, such as uh, proteomics studies. And in addition, uh, if the metabolic pathway that is being targeted is specific to the bacterium and absent from the human host, then uh, these strategies can also be adapted to deliver diagnostic or therapeutic payload to the bacterium, uh, potentially providing new ways to detect and treat infections. So a number of chemical reporters have been developed uh, by other labs for glycoconjugates and gram-negative and gram-positive uh, bacteria. These include uh, monosaccharide reporters for outer membrane lipopolysaccharide and gram-negative bacteria. This is work done by uh, George Wong and Boris uh, Bozeas' groups. Uh, Dennis Casper's group has used monosaccharides to label capsular polysaccharides in gut commensal bacteria. Danielle Duby has done a lot of nice work using monosaccharides, including uh, rare bacterial sugars to label bacterial glycoproteins. And there's been extensive work done uh, on peptidoglycan with D-amino acid-based reporters, which were introduced uh, by the Van Nieuwenza and Bertozzi groups. 
and more recently with monosaccharide based recorders which have been introduced by Catherine Grimes's group so there's a nice suite of tools for tagging different cell envelope components in gram negative and gram positive bacteria but less work has been done uh, in mycobacteria, which is the focus of our group. And we're motivated to, to work with these bacteria because they include some important pathogens, including arguably the pathogen that has the greatest burden on global health, mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, which is responsible for uh, 1.5 million deaths per year, and which has emerged in multi-drug resistant forms, which are extremely challenging and costly to diagnose uh, and treat. So new approaches, both on the basic and the translational side, uh, are needed to better understand and combat this pathogen. And many of those research efforts focus on the mycobacterial cell envelope. And you can tell just on first glance, this is very different than a gram-negative or gram-positive envelope. And in particular, mycobacteria have this uh, thick and hydrophobic outer membrane, which is referred to as uh, the mycomembrane. Uh, this is a glycolipid rich layer that consists in its inner leaflet of so called arabinogalactan mycolates. Uh, these are composed of long chain branched fatty acids called mycolic acids that are esterified to the underlying uh, arabinogalactan polysaccharide. So, this forms the foundation uh, for that outer membrane. Uh, and then other lipids and glycolipids are non-covalently associated with that membrane, including the abundant trahalose glycolipids. I'm showing two uh, common examples here, trahalose mono and dimycolate, which have those same mycolic acids esterified to one or both six positions of this disaccharide called trahalose. Now, trahalose plays a pretty special role in mycobacteria. Not only is it incorporated into these essential glycolipids, but it's also the central mediator for mycomembrane biosynthesis. And I'm going to take you through uh, that biosynthetic pathway because it's important for understanding probe development in this context. So in the cytoplasm, trahalose gets connected to mycolic acid to form TMM. Um, and uh, the blue R group there is the uh, mycoloyal chain, a representative structure of which is shown here on the right. So TMM gets formed uh, in the cytoplasm. It's then flipped across the membrane and outside the cell, TMM serves as the essential mycoloyal donor that's used to build the mycomembrane. So there are enzymes called mycoloyal transferases. These are acyl transferases that essentially grab that blue mycoloyal group and transfer it onto different acceptor substrates thus generating uh, inner leaflet, AGM, and outer leaflet, TDM, which I introduced on the last slide. So, so this process builds those major components of that membrane. It's also uh, been recently discovered that in carini bacteria, which are closely related to mycobacteria, proteins can also be lipidated through this process at serine residues. And it looks like those proteins get embedded into uh, the outer membrane in those organisms. That's a really interesting post-translational modification that I'll talk about more uh, in a few minutes here. In these reactions, trahalose also gets released from the TMM donor and then recycled uh, back into the cell. So these pathways are essential for mycobacterial viability, uh, and they're also conserved across all mycobacterial organisms. And this provides opportunities for the development of mycobacteria-specific chemical reporter probes, uh, the original uh, of which I, I'm showing here. Uh, these include uh, fluorescent and azide modified uh, trahalose derivatives, which were introduced by Ben Davis and Cliff Berry and the Bertozzi groups, uh, respectively. I worked on the azido trahaloses as a postdoc in the Bertozzi group. And what these early studies showed was that uh, these compounds could be taken up and metabolically incorporated into trahalose mycolates like TMM and TDM via mycoloyal uh, transferase activity. Uh, and then those glycolipids can be detected either directly uh, for the fluorescent derivative or via click chemistry uh, for the azido derivatives. And so these probes can be used or adapted for various applications. They've been deployed for many imaging studies, for example, and they also offer opportunities for diagnostic and therapeutic targeting uh, of mycobacteria. And there have been some, some very recent publications that help to uh, support that idea. So 
In my independent lab, uh, we've been motivated to continue working within this research theme uh, because there are many uh, outstanding questions and also opportunities surrounding the glycoconjugates of the mycobacterial cell envelope. And so what we do is we, we develop uh, new tools. These are often functionalized bacterial carbohydrates um, that have applications in imaging, chemical proteomics, and this work is, is carried out toward the identification of, of novel drug targets. Um, these compounds can be developed as metabolic inhibitors that, that block cell envelope biosynthesis or, or remodeling processes. And then, of course, uh, we also develop uh, methods to synthesize these structures efficiently and make them uh, accessible uh, to the wider community as well. So today, what I'm going to do is uh, share with you uh, two projects uh, that, that my group has been working on uh, within this uh, broader research theme. And the first project is a synthetic one that we've been working on in close collaboration with uh, Pete Woodruff's group at the University of Southern Maine over the last several years. And this project stems from the fact that although these probe molecules, which I introduced in the last couple of slides, uh, look apparently uh, fairly simple, they're not trivial to synthesize using traditional techniques, as you can see from the step counts and overall yields for these two uh, examples. So let's take a closer look at trahalose's structure uh, to understand why that is. So trahalose in its native form uh, is a non-reducing disaccharide that consists of two glucose units that are connected together via a, a rather rare 1-1 one, one alpha alpha glycosidic bond. So if one wants to synthesize an analog of this structure, there, there are two general approaches that can be taken. Uh, you can start with native trahalose um, and desymmetrize it using regioselective hydroxyl group manipulation reactions to expose the desired site of modification to be modified. Uh, and then the intermediate be protected to give the target molecule. Uh, alternatively, one can synthesize a two suitably protected monosaccharide building blocks, which can then be linked together via a chemical glycosylation and following deprotection, the target can be obtained. Uh, these glycosylations typically suffer from low stereoselectivity or lengthening, lengthy building block preparations or both. And so while there are some really nice methods in both of these categories, some of which we use regularly. Um, generally, they suffer um, from long uh, step counts, low, low overall yields, and they require high synthetic expertise to carry out. Um, so we've been exploring uh, new methods for uh, producing these compounds that are, that are enzymatic uh, in nature. And nature provides a number of pathways for trahalose biosynthesis that can potentially be considered for synthetic applications. Uh, these all have their pros and cons, of course, and I won't go through those in detail, um, but, but I, I will uh, highlight one synthesis that, that has been done before. This is, uh, again, by the ba Davis and Berry groups, where they utilize a three-step free enzyme system to synthesize a fluorinated trahalose derivative, and this was inspired by the OTSAB uh, biosynthetic pathway. Um, we, we were surprised, though, that there was relatively limited work done in this area. And so when we got started here, we wanted to look for a potential route that was a little bit more concise with this. And so the, the TRAE-T pathway drew our attention. Um, TRAE-T uh, is a glycosyl transferase in a hyperthermophilic organism called Thermoproteus 10x. And it couples together two relatively simple substrates, glucose, and UDP glucose in a single step uh, to form trahalose. Uh, in addition, uh, this is a heat stable enzyme, so that provides some practical benefits. So we thought that this would provide a good opportunity to develop a chemoenzymatic approach to making trahalose derivatives. Uh, and our, our groups have been working on uh, developing a method based on this pathway over the last few years, testing its scope uh, and optimizing it. And the current synthetic process is shown here. Um, now we're able to generate a fairly wide variety of, of trahalose analogs from their corresponding uh, glucose analogs uh, in, in pretty high yield and in pure form and in only a, a couple of hours, thanks to pretty rapid uh, reaction and purification processes here. Um, tray T is fairly tolerant of a wide variety of modifications. Uh, at various positions around the hexose ring, aside 
uh, from the four position. And as you can see from the HPLC yields that are shown here, uh, the conversions are pretty high for many substrates, in some cases uh, quantitative, and the isolated yields are typically in the range of about 70 to 80%. Uh, this method originally developed by two undergraduate students in, in my group, Bailey Urbanic and Doug Wing, uh, has since been uh, used to obtain and apply uh, various types of trahalose analogs in mycobacteria research. So I'm just gonna give you a snapshot of that on this slide. Um, we've developed uh, multiple clickable trahalose analogs for imaging of mycobacteria. We've been able to synthesize a radioactive fluorine-18 modified trahalose as a possible pet imaging probe um, for visualizing uh, mycobacterial infections in vivo. We have developed trahalose-based inhibitors that block mycobacterial biofilm formation. Um, Trahalase-resistant analogs, which resist hydrolysis uh, by enzymes that degrade uh, tr trahalose. And we've uh, worked on a number of collaborative projects with those compounds. And we've also recently been looking at uh, trahalosamines. And this is a project that I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in here because I think it nicely benchmarks uh, the, the tray T catalysis method versus chemical synthesis methods. Um, and uh, this, this project was initially kicked off by uh, an undergraduate student in the group, Jessica Gronvelt. Um, she's currently doing her PhD at Wayne State University. And it's been picked up by a current graduate student in the group uh, named Karishma uh, Kalera. So let's take a closer look at trahalose. I mean, this is essentially the 2-amino, two 2-deoxy two version of trahalose. And trahalose amine was actually first isolated from streptomyces in 1957 through, through a pretty arduous isolation process. So it's actually a natural product. And it was shown at the time to have fairly potent antimycobacterial uh, activity. But there haven't been any follow-up studies done uh, on this molecule, perhaps because it's difficult to get a hold of. Uh, Trahalosamine can also potentially be a synthetic precursor to related pro-molecules that I've already introduced uh, that have nitrogen atoms at the two position, like 2-azidotrahalose and, and 2 fluorescein uh, trahalose. As you can see, uh, all of these structures are, are fairly difficult to get a hold of. And so we wondered whether tray T catalysis might be able to offer a more expedient route to uh, these molecules. So we, we set out to try to identify uh, substrate analogs containing nitrogen atom at the two position that the tray T would tolerate. So, so we screen different substrates using a luminescence-based glycosyl transferase assay, uh, where the native substrates, glucose and UDP glucose, uh, are set to 100% relative enzyme activity. And we had, we had no luck altering the acceptor. Um, as glucosamine and glycnac and 2-azidoglucose showed little to no activity. This was a little surprising given that we'd seen pretty good tolerance for the two-position modifications uh, for other substrates. Um, and, and so this was disappointing, but it got us thinking that we should try synthesis in the opposite mode. So by altering the, the donor molecule instead of the acceptor molecule. So we tested out some commercial UDP sugars and found that UDP glycnac actually serves as a donor just as well as UDP glucose does. And so with that information, we developed a chemoenzymatic synthesis of trahalosamine that was initiated by coupling of glucose and UDP glycnac uh, via tray T catalysis to generate this intermediate trainac in about 80% yield. And then we could um, deacetylate the two position with hydrazine to give us trahalosamine in two steps and in pretty good yield. And then we could further elaborate trahalosamine into the two probes shown above by performing either diazotransfer or reaction with FITSI. And so instead of accessing these compounds in nine to 11 steps, we can access them in two to three steps. So I think this uh, nicely shows how tray T catalysis and, and more broadly chemoenzymatic synthesis in general is a good option for making bacterial carbohydrates uh, and their analogs. And I'd also just like to point out that uh, Karishma has done a lot of work um, extending this system. She's synthesized a number of trahalosamine deriv derivatives and is evaluating those in mycobacterium tuberculosis. And I hope to be able to uh, share more information about that project in the near future. Uh, for, for the remainder of the talk, I'd like to uh, discuss 
uh, how we've been using carbohydrate-based chemical reporters to answer a, a very fundamental question about the composition of the mycobacterial cell envelope. And, and that is what proteins exist in the mycomembrane. So it's been predicted that there are numerous proteins that reside in this membrane, um, maybe over 100 uh, that may have likely functions related to cell envelope synthesis and remodeling, secretion processes, nutrient influx, and host pathogen interaction. So some, some pretty important predicted functions for those proteins. And these proteins are also, of course, more surface accessible. And so they may represent uh, valuable drug targets. And one of the problems here, though, as highlighted in this review article, is that only a handful of outer membrane proteins across the entire my mycobacterium genus uh, have been identified and characterized so far. And that's because the complexity of this ce cell envelope has so far made it very difficult to develop tools and techniques that allow for the selective enrichment and analysis of mycomembrane proteins. Um, so, so we thought that, that because these proteins are either covalently modified by or non-covalently interact with outer membrane glycolipids, we might be able to adapt some of our probe scaffolds to enable capture and analysis of those proteins. And I'm going to talk to you about two projects uh, within that uh, space today. Um, both of those were initiated by Herbert Kavanja, a postdoc in the lab, uh, who is now a chief scientist at ISO Therapeutics, Shupi Wong's company in East Lansing. Um, and since he left, those have been picked up by uh, two graduate students in my group, Nicholas Bonahene and Kyle Vigas. So the first project here uh, focuses in on those post-translationally mycoloylated, lipidated uh, proteins uh, that are present in Carinibacterium. These were originally identified in 2010. And the first, and at the time, the only proteins that were known to carry this uh, PTM uh, were pore A and pore H, which assembled together to form a heterodimeric porin protein that localizes to the mycomembrane. And so based on this information, we, we hypothesized that perhaps other proteins in this organism are also lipidated through the same process. And secondly, that that lipidation may facilitate trafficking of the protein to the outer membrane in association with the outer membrane. And if, if both of those things are true, then a strategy for labeling those proteins uh, would, could be used to assist in the identification and characterization of at least a subset of mycomembrane proteins uh, in these uh, carini bacteria. Now, these do include some important pathogens, such as uh, the one that causes diphtheria. And so in part to pursue this protein labeling strategy, uh, we developed a new class of chemical reporters, not based on trahalose per se, but based on trahalose monomycolate. So these have a different function than the previously reported uh, probes. So let's uh, take a peek back at the, the biosynthetic scheme here and, and revisit TMM. So TMM, recall, is the, the universal mycoloil donor. So it gets that blue mycoloil group transferred onto uh, acceptor substrates, including those uh, mycoloylated proteins. And so we thought that if we could synthesize an unnatural version, version of TMM with a simplified ACL chain and a clickable alkyne handle and fed that to bacteria, if it mimicked the function of TMM, then that terminal alkyne would be deposited onto mycoloil acceptors, including uh, proteins here. So we initially uh, published this class of reporters in 2016 uh, for studying glycolipids in the outer membrane, TDM and AGM. Uh, and after that, Herbert was interested in determining whether this probe would also be useful for uh, studying these lipidated proteins. And so here's the general workflow that Herbert used to, to test this idea out. He took Carinibacterium glutamicum, a model organism, that's known to contain these proteins. And he, he treated them with our probe, uh, which would in principle install alkynes onto those proteins. Uh, he extracted proteins and then we could perform click chemistry to install a fluorophore on those proteins. And then they could be analyzed by in-gel fluorescence 
and the fluorescent bands could be excised and analyzed by mass spec to uh, assist with identification. So first Herbert focused in on a chloroform methanol extract from these cells. It only contained, as you can see in the Kumasi gel on the left here, it only contained a few proteins. And the reason why he focused on this particular extract is because our validation proteins, port A and port H, are present here. Okay, these are highly hydrophobic proteins that come out in a chloroform methanol extract. And following the, the workflow shown above and doing in gel fluorescence analysis, uh, Herbert found that our probe indeed labeled those validation proteins, POR A and POR H, as well as uh, several other proteins in this extract as well. And using mass spec, we we're able to identify that two other proteins, POR B and POR C, which are also known mycomembrane porins, uh, were lipidated. And so our, our data showed that for the first time. And that further supports the hypothesis that protein lipidation is associated with residency of the proteins uh, within the micromembrane. So since that uh, initial work, which we published in 2016, uh, Nicholas Bonahene has been expanding our search uh, for this PTM to the whole proteome of this organism, Prinibacterium glutamicum. Um, here we see uh, in gel fluorescence analysis of, of different fractions uh, obtained from treated, probe treated cells. Uh, lane one is the chloroform methanol extract. Uh, lane two is cytosolic proteins where we don't see uh, much, if any, protein labeling. And then lane three is a detergent extract uh, where you can see that we're pulling out uh, numerous additional higher molecular weight species that appear to be probe labeled. So Nicholas has adapted the workflow above to enable click mediated biotinylation and affinity enrichment of these proteins. And then he's analyzed those proteins by label-free quantitative uh, proteomic analysis. And uh, through that work, he has identified about 25 or so proteins that are significantly enriched in the probe-treated bacteria versus the untreated control. These include porin proteins, as well as mycoloyal transferase proteins and other proteins of interest as well, including secreted hydrolases and many of uh, uncharacterized Function. So right now he's working to validate the lipidation state uh, of these proteins. And so this is a nice tool to study this PTM uh, in perine bacteria. But one of the, the limitations of this approach is that at least right now, based on the evidence that exists, the PTM does not appear to occur in mycobacteria, including mycobacterium tuberculosis. So these are the organisms that we're most interested in elucidating the mycomembrane proteome in. And so we've been working toward a, what we hope will be a more general strategy to enable selective capture and identification of mycomembrane proteins, uh, hopefully in any mycobacterial species. And so uh, toward accomplishing this, we have designed and synthesized some new TMM reporters with uh, three key features. They have the mycomembrane targeting uh, trahalose moiety, and then they have a photo cross-linking diazer, diazering group that can, uh, in principle, capture proteins within the micromembrane, and then a terminal alkyne to enable click chemistry-mediated detection or enrichment of cross-linked proteins. So the idea uh, is that uh, these probes can be metabolically incorporated into the micromembrane in live mycobacteria. Uh, in principle, uh, putting the labeled glycolipid in proximity to proteins that exist in the outer membrane, but not in other uh, compartments of the cell, such as the plasma membrane or the cytoplasm. After incorporation, then, the live cells can be UV irradiated to affect covalent photo crosslinking between the protein and the diazering group. And this effectively then would install an alkyne tag onto the protein. After this, cells can be lysed, click chemistry can be performed to deliver a uh, detection or affinity tag onto those proteins, enabling downstream uh, analysis uh, of various types. And so we published uh, on this project last year, um, and we did a number of experiments to confirm incorporation of these probes into the micromembrane. So I'm gonna focus on the protein uh, labeling data from this project. The workflow is shown here. It's, it's similar to what I've already described for the other project. 
Here we're starting with a mycobacterial species, Mycobacterium smegmatis. This is a model organism that is uh, treated with our probe, then exposed to UV irradiation and lyes. This should generate lysates containing target proteins that are alkyne labeled, and then can be uh, further functionalized using a trifunctional azide that contains both fluorophore and affinity tags. So that would enable both uh, fluorescence detection and affinity enrichment. Um, so that gives us our pre-enrichment input samples, which can then be uh, enriched for putative mycomembrane proteins using avenin beads, uh, which can then be eluded to give us our post-enrichment output samples. And then those can be analyzed by uh, in gel fluorescence or Western blot. So briefly, um, what we found uh, looking at these in gel uh, fluorescence analyses of the inputs and the outputs, you can see that we indeed were able to uh, capture proteins and uh, detect them via click chemistry uh, only in probe treated UV exposed bacteria. And then we were also able to enrich those proteins as well. So you can see those uh, results in lane four, whereas in lanes one through three, those are controls that either lack probe treatment or UV exposure uh, or both. So we're able to capture proteins uh, from the cell using our probe, but are they relevant? Um, so in order to answer that question, we did Western blot analysis, probing for two validation proteins, including uh, a porin called MSPA and a micro oil transferase called antigen 85. And as you can see in the input samples, we observed equal amounts of both the porin MSPA and the micro oil transferase antigen 85, but in the outputs, both of those proteins were clearly enriched. So this provided confidence that the probe was pulling down a bona fide mycomembrane proteins. And so next, similar to the last project, uh, we did a whole proteome analysis of the enriched samples by label-free quantitative uh, proteomics. And again, we identified a number of proteins, around 100 actually, that are significantly enriched in the probe-treated UV exposed condition uh, versus the UV unexposed control. And uh, again, we're seeing relevant proteins here, including our validation proteins, uh, MSPA porin and multiple microlyl transferases, as well as a number of other proteins with known mycomembrane uh, synthesis, remodeling and transport uh, functions, plus a number of uncharacterized proteins that are of high interest uh, uh, for follow-up. And, and we are excited to take this probe and, and do similar experiments in mycobacterium tuberculosis as a next step. So uh, basically these, these last two projects then uh, represent the first chemical tools for studying the mycomembrane proteome. Um, and so we're, we're excited uh, to see where those go next. Um, as sort of a, a broader recap here to my talk, um, hopefully I've shown you that uh, synthetic bacterial carbohydrate analogs uh, can be used to tease apart and target uh, the cell envelope of uh, an important group of pathogens, a mycobacteria. And I think these types of approaches are, of course, more broadly applicable to bacterial glycoconjugates in general. Uh, with that, I think my time is up. So I would like to thank my group. Um, I've highlighted the students uh, who, have, who have done the work on the projects that I focused on, on today. And it, it's, it's wild to see how quickly this list grows uh, in only eight years. But I thank all of my students for all of their efforts over those, those eight years here at CMU. I'd also like to thank our funding sources, as well as, again, the organizers of the symposium and, and you all for being here and your attention. Be happy to take any questions.